Hello, students. Welcome to the first of our official lectures for Biology 120 or General Biology. If you haven't already, go ahead and view that welcome video I made. But now we're going to actually get into the course content itself. So as you might have guessed, biology is the study of life. Specifically, it's the study of things that we consider alive. Now, for the sake of this class, it's probably useful to define what it means to be alive and what we consider living organisms versus non-living organisms. This might sound strangely philosophical to really look at a thing and be like, how do we consider it as being alive or not? But actually, there are a set of rules that we as biologists use to determine if something is alive or not. So when you think of living organisms, you probably think of things like your pets, maybe a potted plant that you have in your house, but it's not just plants and animals that are alive. There are plenty of other things that are alive as well. Fungi, for instance, which are not plants, but actually more closely related to animals, are considered alive. And there are many small, tiny things that you would actually need to look at a microscope with to actually determine what they are. And many of these microscopic organisms are also alive. So probably in the lab version of this class, you would go ahead and make slide mounts where you would look at things that tiny as they are, they're still made up of hundreds or even thousands of cells. So these could include things like nematodes, these small wriggly worms that live in soil, water, or are parasitic. And it even includes some popular on the internet animals like tardigrades, also commonly known as water bears. So even though these things are microscopic, they're definitely alive. And they're actually quite complex animals with, again, hundreds or thousands of cells. However, if you look at an even higher magnification, you'll see that there are single-celled organisms that you can also see with a compound microscope. For instance, you have things like the protist, and you have things like bacteria. Even though these organisms are only made with one cell, that's all they have is that single cell, so we called them single-celled life, they are just as alive as you are. I've sort of jumped ahead by mentioning the word cell and referencing that there are organisms that have one cell, which we call single-celled life, and organisms that have hundreds, thousands, millions, or billions of cells. And so this is getting at the first rule that we have. Living things or organisms have at least one cell. So you might be wondering, why is a cell so important? The reason that a cell is so important is that it is the basic unit of life. It is the smallest thing that actually carries out all of the required functions to be considered alive. Now, of course, a cell is made up of atoms and molecules and matter, but those smaller components aren't actually considered alive. The cell is the smallest unit that can be considered alive. So let's talk about what's so important about a cell. Throughout this video, I'm going to cover some of the important requirements to be considered alive, but it's important to remember that all of those requirements at some point happen at the cellular level. For instance, it's the cell that actually takes in energy and nutrients, in your case, from your digestive system, and uses them to build the products that you need to make more of yourself and basically survive. It's also the cell that's going to contain DNA. DNA are the important instructions for making more of yourself and are integral to both cellular reproduction and the production of the gametes that you need as a species to reproduce. It's also that DNA within the cell that is the site of mutations. Those mutations give rise to differences and different forms and different adaptations which are going to be sort of the raw materials for natural selection and evolution to work on. And evolution, again, is one of my favorite topics in all of biology because it shows how organisms become more adapted to their environment over very long periods of time. So all of this is happening at the cellular level. In so quite a few organisms on this planet only have one cell. Again, we call these single-celled life. Common examples would be something like this amoeba that you see here. This is an organism that since it has only one cell, that one cell does everything. 
It carries out all the taking in of nutrition and energy. It does all of the building of new components. It does all of the reproduction. Everything is happening in that one cell. You, on the other hand, are an extremely complex organism that's made up of billions and billions of cells. For a complex billion-celled organism like yourself, we say that you have some specialization of your cells. For instance, the epithelial cells that make up the lining of your small intestine are particularly good at absorbing nutrients into your blood system. On the other hand, the really wildly shaped neurons that make up your nervous system are particularly good at sending chemical and neurological messages from one cell to the next in that system. When you are a complex organism with billions of cells, you have different levels of organization. The first level is the cell level. The second level is the tissue level, in which a tissue is composed of cells that are very similar and function towards a similar role. The organ level is the next level of organization, and in the organ level, you'll have several different tissue types that are working together. An organ is usually part of an organ system. So for instance, your stomach is part of your digestive system. And that begins with your mouth and goes all the way to your rectum. You have multiple organs, each made up of own tissues, each made up of a bunch of cells. So you build that complexity until finally you reach an organism. Now, in addition to you having a digestive system, you also have a respiratory system and a nervous system. As an organism, you have multiple different organ systems. This brings us to our second rule. Living things or organisms require energy and nutrients to survive. I really like to bring this back to the cellular level by reminding myself that a cell is essentially like a tiny factory. It's going to take in energy and nutrients as inputs and then use those inputs, reorganize them, and build products that if you're a multi-celled organism like yourself, are sent out of the cell and are required for you to survive. Now, how you get these energy and nutrient forms differ based on the type of organism that you are. A producer can get energy and nutrients from a process known as photosynthesis. So if you're a plant, you can take carbon dioxide from the air, you can take water from your roots, and then using energy from the sun, you can build those things into sugar and oxygen. Now, as a consumer, we can't build our own sugar. Instead, we have to consume sugar, usually as the products of those producers. So if you're a cow, you're going to eat grass. That grass is the product of photosynthesis. If you're an omnivore, like I am, you're going to also consume other consumers, and in that consumption, you're going to get access to other inputs that you need to survive as well. So for instance, if you eat a cheeseburger, you're going to get carbs from the burger bun, which is the product of photosynthesis from wheat, but you're also going to get fats and proteins from the burger patty and the cheese as well. That material is going to go through your digestive system, it's going to get broken down, and then your cells are eventually going to receive some inputs. The carbohydrates are going to go through your mitochondria when they're converted to ATP, and then the amino acids from proteins are going to be used to build other proteins that you need to survive. Collectively, all of these chemical reactions that occur in your cell are known as your metabolism. Now, the only way your cells are going to be able to carry out those thousands of reactions that make up your metabolism is if they also maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis refers to the optimum operating conditions that your cells need to function properly. And this is going to differ based on what organism you are. For instance, a polar bear is going to be able to tolerate much higher temperatures than we could. So if your cells leave homeostasis, they don't function as well as they should, and this could eventually lead to the death of the organism. As a human, there are certain temperatures that we function best in. If we get too hot or too cold, we start to shut down and this is bad. And it isn't just temperature. There are other conditions that have to be maintained. The amount of water within your cells, the amount of salt, 
the pressure that you're at. This is going to differ based on what organism you are and how adapted you are to your environment. Now, complex organisms like us have a variety of adaptations that allow us to maintain homeostasis. Some that you might be familiar with are sweating. Sweating is a way that you help to lower your body temperature when it gets past those optimum conditions. On the other hand, shivering, which is where your muscles sort of shake together, helps to raise your body temperature to get you back to a level that you need to function properly. Now, there are limits, of course. If you are way too far beyond what you can actually accomplish with these adaptations, you're going to have some problems. But to actually maintain homeostasis, sweating or shivering, that comes at an energy cost. So it's not just that your cells need energy and nutrients to build stuff that you need to survive. They also need it to have energy to maintain that homeostasis properly. They're also going to use that energy to respond to stimuli that might signal a change to the conditions the organism is facing. Which brings us to our next requirement. Living things respond to changes to survive. These changes can be both internal or external stimuli, which basically means some sort of change. A good example of an internal stimuli is something that's coming from inside the organism. Like when your stomach grumbles, that is a stimuli to indicate that you might need to eat some food. External stimuli are things that happen outside of the organism. For instance, when the sun rises, many flowers, which are daytime pollinated, might open their petals as a response to that external change or external stimuli. Collectively, we call these responses to different stimuli behavior. So whether it's internal or external stimuli, when an organism responds, it is expressing some sort of behavior. So you can also think of this role as living things have behavior. Take, for instance, a cold-blooded lizard. It might sit on a rock to absorb some heat when it first wakes up in the morning to heat itself up. Or it might respond to a fly flying by, that's external stimuli, and the response might be to lash out its sticky tongue and eat it. Those are both examples of behavior. Even single-celled life still exhibits behavior. You can observe bacteria actually moving towards a food source in response to the existence of that food. That's behavior. For this next rule, we are actually going to go back into the cell. And this rule is that living things develop and reproduce. We have to go back into the cell right now because what's actually going to control that development and reproduction is DNA. To put it simply, DNA is basically the instruction manual for building an organism, whether it's a single-celled organism or a million or billion-celled organism like you. It's going to be that DNA that codes for the information that results in whatever is being developed. So in short, DNA is basically the instruction manual, and almost every cell has DNA in it, although there are some exceptions like mature red blood cells. What's important about DNA is that fundamentally it controls growth. You start out as a single-celled organism called a zygote, you go through a couple rounds of cellular division, and then many, 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 many rounds of cellular division later, you're finally a fully developed embryo, much like this chick here. So all of that development is going to be controlled by DNA, and also growth that occurs during that chicken's lifespan. Additionally, it's going to be DNA that plays a fundamental role in reproduction. So in an asexually reproducing organism, you start with one cell with 100% of DNA that splits into two cells that also have the entire package of DNA. In a sexually reproducing organism like us, you go through meiosis, resulting in sex cells called gametes that have 50% of DNA, and that's so that they can eventually combine with another sex cell. That DNA is also going to be fundamental to our next rule, and that is, is that living organisms are the result of evolution. Okay, so back to DNA. DNA is going to be the site where which mutations can occur, and mutations are basically changes to those instruction manuals. Now, those mutations can result into changes to the organism's appearance or any other physiological or physical features. 
these mutations are by and large detrimental. Usually it's lethal to the organism that they result in. But very, very occasionally, a mutation might give some sort of reproductive edge to the organism that inherits that mutation. So a reproductive edge basically means that you are able to gain more resources and reproduce with greater success than the other members of your species. So when you consider an organism like the one I'm drawing here, it's got these bizarre giant eyes, it's got this ridiculously huge mouth, it is essentially one of the weirdest birds I've ever seen. This thing is known as a potu, or potu, I'm not really quite sure on the pronunciation, but it's bizarre. They were popular on the internet a few years ago. Go ahead and look them up. And you might be looking at an organism like this and wondering, how does this come to be? And all of those bizarre traits, the giant mouth, the giant eyes, those are all features which are making it more suited to its environment. We know them as adaptations. So adaptations make you more suited to your environment and they're a result of these occasional mutations that give you better reproductive success. So as bizarre as this organism looks, it evolved that way because it helps it to survive in its environment. So to be clear, many of the topics I introduced today were generalizations, and we'll explore them in much greater detail as we go throughout the semester. But basically, to be a living organism, you have to have cells, at least one of them, you usually use energy and nutrients, you maintain homeostasis, you respond to stimuli and have behavior, you develop and reproduce, and you are the product of evolution and have a number of adaptations that help you to survive. Things that aren't alive are things like rocks, minerals, the components that make up a cell, and viruses, maybe? So this one is a little bit difficult, but consider this totally not related to any current event virus I'm drawing here. Viruses are kind of a gray area because you might think of them as being alive, but they actually don't meet many of these basic requirements. They don't have any cellular components, which means that they have no metabolism, nor do they maintain homeostasis. They basically are just agents of injecting DNA. So while they do have DNA, they can't actually reproduce on their own. They're entirely parasitic. But we do certainly know that viruses evolve. This is the reason that you have to get a new flu shot every year, is because the DNA in those viruses can definitely mutate and change. So viruses are kind of this weird gray area. They don't meet many of the requirements for being considered alive, but they do have DNA, or in some cases RNA, they have some sort of genetic material, and that genetic material is subject to mutation, which means that it's also subject to evolution as well. So viruses, kind of a gray area, and one where it does get a little bit philosophical, where you have to talk about whether or not something is actually alive. So I'm going to go ahead and end it here, and thank you for listening.